you join me in prayer here as we jump into his word? Lord, I thank you that in the midst of this place today that, that uh, each one of us are on a journey. Each one of us, Lord, you, you spoke and you sang, Lord, over our existence. You formed us in our mother's womb. You brought us, Lord, out of eternity into time so that we would have the opportunity to, to dwell before you. And, Lord, as, as your children make decisions and play a role and be a part of this grand thing, Lord, that you call life. And we're so grateful for it. And, Father, I pray this morning for the divine tension of knowing that we are the center of the universe and your eye is fixed on us, Lord, and the confidence that it that, that comes to our hearts as we walk face to face with you, Lord, and held in tension with the reality that we are but dust before the uncreated God. And who are we, Lord, that you would be mindful of us? Lord, I pray that the tension between these two realities would, would come crashing into us today, that, that we would... Uh, we would know and be known, Holy Spirit, that your presence would be real to us today, that, that, that there would be an unveiling, an emerging, Lord, in our hearts of embracing fully who you've made us to be and at the same time being excited about the adventure that lies before us. Father, I thank you for that. I pray, Lord, that you would breathe into each one fresh breath, fresh life, confidence, Lord, courage to take next steps. And uh, that all these things, Lord, would, would take place by your spirit. And Lord, and then that you would help, help me to uh, articulate, help me to preach, Lord. Help me to say something this morning. And uh, we pray these things right now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Uh, my wife and I have eight children, and so the journey of being a coach is uh, has has been one we have fully embraced. The reality that we get from the littlest of child all the way through onto adulthood, we get the opportunity to to speak into the lives of these people and watch the person that God made them to be emerge right before our eyes. You know, we're a coach. I, I don't get to dictate who my children will become because that comes pre-wired. Anybody here have multiple children? If you have, if you've had multiple children, you know that, uh, that, that very, very unique and different people can emerge from the same pair of parents. We have eight. The first one is a son, and then we had daughters, seven daughters, right in a row. Boom, boom, boom. That is skill right there. I have skill. Right when I when I travel places or I speak someplace else, I like to say that we had a son, and then my son and I got together and decided to start a women's ministry. Right, <laughs> but we we have we have seven daughters right in a row. You know, it's one thing to see that the son is unique, you know, in his own becoming journey, and then but seven daughters in a row, you would think that there's some likeness that would emerge, but. They are, are unique and individual and their very own person, personality, and they're all amazing, and they're all wonderful, and even out of the same two parents, even out of the same household, the same parenting styles, the same uh, techniques in parenting, the, the same family values, the same culture, the same church, they all grew up in the same church, you know? Like, there, there's nothing unique about either any of their journeys in terms of what was put into them. But what's coming out of them, wow. Absolutely unique. Like a snowflake. Like, like fingerprints. DNA. So individual, so amazing, so complex. Our Father in heaven knows you intimately. He knows you individually. He came, 
laid his life down once for all, the just for the unjust, one sacrifice, one propitiation of sins, his blood, righteous sacrifice that paid for all of us. We are becoming a kingdom. We are a priesthood, a holy priesthood. Each one of us came from the Father, but we are unique in expression and unique in calling. You are your own person. And that journey is before your Father. That journey is before your Creator. And at the end of that journey, you're going to stand before Him and you ha will have an accounting. He will judge your life. Everyone individually will stand before the flame of the Lord and his holy fire will test your life. And there will be no hiding from it. There will be no way for you to blame anyone else. You're not going to get to drag me up there with you. You can't blame me. Well, Pastor Jamie said that, and so that's why I screwed that part of my life up. Sorry. It's on you. Are you with me here? Did you know that calling and purpose, identity, that these things are unique to you? That who you are, nobody else gets to tell you who you are. No one, not even your parents. Your peers, they don't get to tell you who you are. Culture doesn't get to tell you who you are. Certainly a law doesn't get to tell you who you are. Natural governments, subcultures, churches. Nobody gets to have the final say over who the Father has made you to be, the assignment that he has given you to carry out on this earth, the fulfillment of calling, the divine purpose that he authored into each one of you, all of these things get to emerge within your journey, and you alone are accountable to your creator for those things being fulfilled. Now, your father is so incredibly good, he makes sure that you have everything that you need for the journey. You will lack no good thing. He's your shepherd. You shall not want You'll lack nothing in terms of what's needed and necessary for you to become who he made you to be. These are truths that I'm saying to you today. It got quiet in here. I'm assuming it's pondering, not just checking out, right? These are truths. They should wash over you. They actually should liberate your heart a little bit because sometimes we get stuck in the the, the, the subcultures of life where they try to name you, they try to give you identity, they try to create for you a structure that you have to live within. These things, they don't get to dictate anything about you. You may find some alignment with it. You may find some, you know, people to journey with, but none of that gets to determine who you are. You stand alone before your creator. And the authenticity of your voice, the authenticity of your life, in terms of eternity, that realm looks at your life and knows if you're lying to yourself. You can fool everybody around you, but you cannot fool God. You can even fool yourself into thinking things. Give yourself self-identities. Doesn't mean it's true. We do that in order to feel okay with choices in our journey. We do that because culture demands it. We do that in order to feel okay with where we're at. But the reality is, y'all, you stand before your God and your journey is unto him alone. Am I touching a nerve yet? We'll get there. My... Uh, the purpose this morning of, of talking with you, the conversation I want to have this morning, it's been on my heart, is, is one of journey. It's one of, of, of sharing with you the, some of the secrets, some of the mysteries that I've discovered personally in my own life, but others have too. These are the pathways 
that I'm talking to you about today, maybe some life principles, uh, that if you'll engage them, it will lead to a transformed life. If, if you engage what I'm talking to you about today, if you'll, if you'll take these things to heart and, and put them into practice in your life, you'll have peace, your identity will become solid and strong, you'll discover purpose, and while what I'm going to share with you is very simple, and, and in its simplicity, from the outside, appears easy. But I assure you that if you attempt to take the pathway that I'm sharing with you today, that there is a war around you within culture and spiritual world that rages against those who attempt to walk in this narrow way that I am talking to you about today. But nothing can stop you. Nothing. The two things, two principles... I'm going to label them this, the lamp and the light, and the second one, meat and bread. The lamp and the light and your daily meals, meat and bread. Let's hit the lamp and the light. You ready? I don't know if you are. Look at your neighbor and go, you came here for this, but I'm not sure you're ready for it. Psalms 119, verse 105. Psalms 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Uh, David would have wrote this poetic language, and it was describing something that he actually saw with his own eyes. In his day, he would have been out in the shepherd's fields, and at nighttime, you know, shepherd boys are out there, and uh, it's funny to me, you know, just the danger and peril that we, we in culture, we have put the, the young ones, you know, David would have been out there with the lions and the bears, right, oh my, and fighting off to, to, to protect the lives of these sheep, and he would have been out there all night alone, right? And, and you can imagine, if you will, he's out in the wilderness, and he's tending to the sheep, and he looks off on the horizon, and he can see across the ridgeline these little flickering lights moving across the ridgeline. Because David would have witnessed nomads in the wilderness in his day making their way across the wilderness and doing so by night. Why? Because it's not as hot as during the day. But in that day, the technology, you know, they're not out there with a Jeep. They don't have floodlights. They're not even carrying lanterns. That's a, that's a, a, a discovery of technology. It doesn't happen until the first century. And David's before that. No, what they had was these little clay vessels, these little lamps. If you've ever seen them, they look like a little genie lamp made out of clay. And they would store oil in them, and then they would light the end of it, and light would illuminate, and they would tie them to the tops of their sandals, one on their left foot, one on their right. A lamp to your feet and a light to your path. God's word literally being seen. And this is the type that he uses to describe this experience of being led by the Lord. And it is as true today as it ever has been in history. This is how God leads your life. See, the lamp was tied to the top of the sandals and it would be lit. And so, lit. I did it again, Dave. I don't. Man, there, are, there was like 10 different words I mispronounced in the first service. We'll play a little game, right? Whoever gets them right and quotes back to me wins a prize. The lamp is lit, one on the left, one on the right, so that, and think about this. First of all, the lamp does not give off much light at all. It's not bright. It's bright enough, but only for the person. 
So with the step of the left foot, that lamp now illuminates around that left foot. Yeah? Enough to see obstacles, enough to see holes, snakes, scorpions, something. Right? There the left foot goes down and the illumination happens to this area here just enough for the right foot to come forward and know where it's stepping. And so with each progressive step, there's clarity to the path. When the right foot goes forward, we now see where the left foot can go. And step by step, the path emerges. It's not seen and determined from the outset where you should go and how to get there. But in fact, you are completely dependent upon the revelation that your lamp is giving you, and it is step by step. Oh. We're going someplace this morning. I, I, you know, you might be able to predict it, but whoo, you should take the journey because we're going to get someplace. You ready? That lamp is filled with oil, and that oil comes from connectedness with the Lord. In fact, the lamp of your life, the illumination from your life, the revelation that you give to the world around you is based on the oil that's poured through you. Your connection with the Lord and you walking with him and him giving revelation to you about this is who you are, son, daughter. This is, this is what I'm doing in creation. This is the story and father is telling you the story that you are intimately involved in. But it's like C.S. Lewis defined through Aslan, the character in the, the Narnia stories, where one of the children is asking about another one of them and, and saying, well, what about them? What, what's going to come next for their life? And Aslan looks at the child and says, my child, I am telling you your story, not theirs. See, because that's the reality of your relationship with the Lord is that the Lord is talking to you and is connected to you and he's giving light to your path. That your connection with him gives you oil to burn and that revelation illuminates your steps. Every time you come into his presence, every time your heart opens and you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit or you open the word and you're reading the Bible and Jesus speaks to you. You come into a worship service, right? And worship's lit. It's a party. Woo! Right? You, you know the difference between when your heart is cracked open and you're receiving and you're connecting with the Lord or when you just put a good face on it. You know the difference. Come on, you know the difference between just phoning it in. Yep, I had my quiet time today. I read the Bible. I can check off the devotional box. You know, I feel good about myself. But you know whether you just received from heaven or not. You know when impartation of life comes into you when you're having fellowship with a friend. You're talking with another believer, right, and the light of their life pours into you. And somehow in the midst of it, you connected with Jesus. I don't know how he does that, but he does it. You're listening to some preacher drone on and on and on and on and on and somewhere lost in the middle of it, you zone out and the Holy Spirit speaks to you and you got something out of this message this morning. <laughs> okay, all right. That oil comes into your life not through religious practices, not through doing things correctly, but through the actual connectedness between you and the Lord. That's where the oil comes into your life. That's where revelation comes from is the Lord reveals things to you. He peels back the veil and helps you to see Jesus a little more clearly. And suddenly you're discovering things about life that you could have never seen before, but it's because he revealed them to you. Is anybody alive this morning? This is where the oil of your life comes from. This is where the, the lamp unto your feet, the light unto your path comes from, your connection with him. But see, the lamp and the light to your life is meant for you. God is talking to you about you. 
when we prophesy or when we minister to other people, sometimes the Holy Spirit gives us little glimpses into other people's journeys, right? You might get a word of knowledge. Happens to me often. I'll, I'll get a word of knowledge for someone, and I'll know something specific about their journey, and or the Lord might give me a word of wisdom. A uh, uh, really uh, uh, the the exact application, what they should do in this circumstance. That comes through the Holy Spirit. It's one of His gifts. He manifests for the sake of another person. And in that moment, there's something weird happens, though, because I'll give someone a word of wisdom, and it'll be exactly what they needed to hear. And it lights them up. What? And they will wrongly assume that I have more information that I'm not telling them. I give them a prophetic word, and it will breathe life into their soul. And then the follow-up question, well, then what should I do? Okay, and this, my friends, is where I am inviting our community into maturity. This is where I am chastising the immature prophets among us. And I am inviting those who are growing in the gift, the manifestation gift of the Holy Spirit in prophecy, I am inviting our community to grow and to mature in this gifting, in the practice of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because in our growth, we will, like, major stuff's going to happen. Some good things are going to happen. Right, if I have a word of knowledge for, let's say, Pastor Dave is sitting up here and I have a word of knowledge and it's accompanied by a piece of advice. In that moment, it would be really easy for me to just tack on some other things I'd like to see him do with his life. And this is where the immaturity of the body of Christ begins to manifest, is that the Holy Spirit will, through you, prophesy in part, and you catch a glimpse, and that glimpse is speaking to and very helpful for that person to be confident in their next step. But the Lord is not inviting us to predict their futures. <laughs> Prophecy is for building up. Right? For giving momentum or strengthening, encouraging people in their current journey. Edification, exhortation, and consolation. To comfort, to build up, to give courage for taking that step, but not to determine where someone goes with their life. <sighs> Friends, the reason why this is so important is because of the truth that I'm trying to spell out to you today, and it is this. Okay, your journey before the Lord is between you and him. And the body of Christ rallies around you to give you courage and strength and partner with you, but none of us can tell you who you are becoming. No one can determine your identity before him. We can't. So please... As the body, let's mature and grow so, and not put pressure on our young prophetic voices. When someone gives you an encouraging word, don't lean in and ask them to make a decision that you're supposed to be making. Don't, let's, not, let's, not put pressure, let's not put pressure on individuals or leaders even to, Pastor James, what do you think I should do? Let's not do that. In fact, what maturity looks like in spiritual leadership and discipleship is if you come to me asking a question, I put up the mirror and I say, well, what has the Lord said to you? And, and in light of what the Lord has said to you and in light of what his word says, what do you think you should do? See, 
in you owning and being self-responsible for your decisions, it forces a maturity to rise up out of you. And then we will grow up in all aspects unto him. Why am I saying these things? Well, because the world's a little, a little nutty right now. And I've watched as Christendom, the Christian world, the churchianity of the world, especially the charismatic wing of it, looks to their prophetic voices to somehow predict the future. Woo! Nonsense. There's no certainty in that. The certainty that we are presented with in the invitation is to know him and to walk with him. And in your anchored to him, the presence, the person, he'll walk you right through the storms. I find that people try to predict the future because they don't want to have to pay attention on the journey. Because if I can tell you what you're supposed to be five years from now and I lay it out for you like that, then you don't have to pay attention to the journey that Jesus has got you on. You can just pre-plan your destiny and try to accomplish that. And then when it doesn't work out, you get to blame me for giving you the wrong word. Is anybody alive today? It's time for maturity. We got to grow. We got to grow. Okay? That means self-responsibility in your journey with the Lord. Now, the lamp and the light. The lamp is for your feet and your path. And the revelation that the Lord gives you and the light of that will be unto your path. And you are accountable unto it unto the Lord. And he rarely gives you more than one step at a time. And the reason that he gives you one step at a time is because when you take that step and he shows you what is next, you have to be obedient to it before the next step is available to you. And so some people get stuck because God revealed something to you and he's like, hey, this is what you have to do next. But we go, ah, uh, I don't wanna. <laughs> what do you mean I gotta go make it right with people? What do you mean I gotta clean up my mess from the last church I ran away from? Ah, <laughs> uh, Listen, listen, I'm glad you're here. God bless you. I am. But I ain't your nanny. And, and if you came to the house church, it's probably to die. To yourself. Right? It's time. Time to grow up. Time to grow up. Okay, so when we ask you what church that you came from, you can bet your bottom dollar that we're going to go ahead and call that pastor and see what bridges you burned there. Woo, everybody puckered up just then. <laughs> Yelza. Why? Because relationally the body of Christ matters. Why? Because your connections in the body of Christ are cyclical. What comes around, it, what goes around comes around. No such thing as okay to burn bridges and destroy people's lives and then just keep moving on. That ain't good. It's no good. Now, I'm being a little funny with you. Some of you really did pucker up when you're like, you're going to call my, no, I'm not, I am not going to call your, but y'all should have seen your faces. Some of you just made a note, better call <laughs> somebody. But if you can, if you can think of right now an active list of people that you have injured or have you made messes with. And that's conscious in your brain. I can promise you that that's part of the Holy Spirit's plan for you to go and make right. We need to be obedient with what he tells us to do so that when we take that step, then the next step opens up to us. He leads us step by step intentionally because he knows how to get you there. He knows the terrain. He knows sometimes that he's got to lead you five years down that path in order to open up the door that seems totally opposite over here because there's a relational connection here that really truly matters. And you would never pick that pathway. But you're going to learn some things in that what you call a dead-end job. You're going to learn some things as you interact with some folks that you don't like being around or whatever. Some of y'all asking yourselves the question, how did I end up in this church? Why am I here? 
The Holy Spirit leads people because he knows that we are going to receive impartation. He knows that there's connections. He knows that your journey is not meant to be separate from one another, but that it very much is interconnected. But that if he dropped all of that on your brain in one moment, he was like, hey, here's the whole plan. You couldn't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth. (laughs) You can't get there. That was a rated R movie. Y'all laughed at it like you knew it. Sinners. (laughs) Sinners. Hey, I watched that before I got saved. All right, before I got saved. Listen. Y'all, this journey, it's accountable unto the Lord, but... But don't think that you're in a vacuum, right? That's why you got to be obedient and walk with him. And as, he, as he, he illuminates things and he grows you and you're taken step by step and he takes you on the journey and you will become who he made you to be. But you got to be honest with this and authentic, step by step. It matters. Every aspect of it matters. The lamp and the light. The light that illuminates from your life, though, it's, one, so it's, the, it's the mystery of it is that the light that's from your lamp, for you, you look down and you see it. It illuminates this path. But from a distance, people see the light from your life. And it shines with the good news of the hope of Jesus Christ. David would have seen those those little lamps walking across the hill ridge way, way far off. You are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. The light of your life shines forth into the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. There's nothing that the devil can do to cover up the impact of your life. That's why it's so important that you're receiving oil from him and letting it burn brightly from your lives. Come on, is anybody alive this morning? All right, you got to listen faster, though, because we didn't get to the next one yet. Here we go. The lamp and the light. Okay, the second thing, we've got to move on here. The second thing that I want to talk to you about is the the daily grind. How do you get there? How do you? So many, I asked this question recently because we talk about hearing the voice of the Lord. And and I, I, I recognize and I realize that not everybody comes from a church background that maybe even taught you how to do that. Or, or that you could You know, sometimes bad doctrine plugs up people's ears because you have zero faith to actually hear what God's saying right now. So you're just closed off to it, and you didn't realize it's just a bad belief that's standing in the way. So I'm here to teach you this morning that you absolutely hear your shepherd's voice. You have since you were born. You're created to know his voice. Holy Spirit of God was imparted to you, given to you, present tense in your life, Emmanuel, God with us. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he speaks, but it doesn't come from way out there. It comes from in here. He's within you. Yes, he's all around you, but his voice echoes within your heart first. And then it gets confirmed out here. That's why you can't hear a word from somebody, a prophetic word telling you who you are, because if it doesn't resonate, it means it wasn't in here first. (laughs) The Lord is intimately involved in your life. And let me tell you, he wants to talk to you about mysteries. He wants to reveal some things to you. He wants to take you on a divine adventure. You know, this two weeks ago, my son and I were in Ireland And uh, I brought some pictures back for you. So, Chad, would you do me? Yeah, there you go. Okay. So, Josiah and I decided, this is the first day, we got off the plane and we head straight across the island to the Cliffs of Moher. Anybody ever been to Cliffs of Moher? Amazing place. Amazing place. They're, you know, they're, uh, it's very hard to see here in terms of just how big they are. But they're, you know, they're several hundred feet off the ocean deck there. Right? And so, I took a a picture of the sign just so that you're aware. Right? Um, most people visit the tourist location, which is right center in the middle of it, and they have beautiful paths and, and fences and, like, walls of partition preventing you from falling off the face of the earth. 
but there is a little trail, right, to the left and right. And if you'll take a journey down that little trail, it will take you about eight miles down the coast all the way to the next town. And so Josiah and I decided, hey, let's have a dad adventure, right? So here we go, right? So uh, let's see if we can find the next, next picture there. Okay. What you can't see right here in the edge of this photo is, you know, a 200-foot cliff right there. And then there's a little video. Let's see if we can throw that up here. You just kind of get a sense of, okay, yep, here's the cliffs. All right, and then we come to where the path is washed away. Yep, there it is. It's washed away. Goes down to your death. Yes. Here we go. And we quickly move over. Yes, there we go. Okay. So Josiah and I decide we're going to take this journey. Now, this is a father-son journey. Right? There's adventure in it. Step by step in it. We're on it together. We're walking it together. Out in the middle of nowhere, there's nobody around. You know, the crowds stop about half a mile down the path. Because the path kind of stops. And it goes from paved path to what you saw there. And most people enjoy the safety of a sure path and a fence. Okay? And my son... And my children, rightfully so, each one of us and the parent in us is screaming, don't you dare go any further. The kid in us is like, yeah, let's go on an adventure. But the parent in us is screaming safety, caution, prevent, right? Can I tell you that the Father in heaven... He's the one inside of you going, ooh, I wonder what's up around the bend. <laughs> yeah, I know, it looks dangerous. Yes, your mother's going to kill me for showing this in church. <laughs> but oh, the stories that we're going to have to share, son. You know, something about a little danger, step-by-step -step journey, out into the unknown that awakens something on the inside of you and suddenly you're having conversations on a deeper level than you ever would have been able to get to back where the tourists are. See, the Father in Heaven wants to take you on a journey and he has some mysteries. He has some things that he wants to show you, he wants to talk to you about, but you're going to have to take the journey with him. Do you know that God ordered creation Nighttime to daytime. That the beginning of the day is the setting of the sun. The beginning of tomorrow happens at sunset tonight. The scripture says that God created and it was evening and morning on the first day. And it was evening and morning the second day. See, the created order of things and the speaking into the chaos and the emerging is happening in the night season. The deep things and the mysteries are being unlocked in the evening. Anybody in here a morning person? Anybody? Okay, anybody a night owl? Hey, I knew there was some mystery hunters in here. Let me read something to you. The journey of Israel out of slavery into promised land. They found themselves out in the wilderness and they're being led day by day by the presence of the Lord. They're having to. They don't know the way. And God's bringing them out of a slave's mentality and he's bringing them into a promised land mentality. Isn't that the life of a Christian? That God's bringing you out of bondage and he's bringing you into a land of promise? Look at how God does it. The Lord spoke to Moses, this is verse 11, Exodus 16. I heard the grumblings of the children of Israel speak to them and say, at twilight you'll eat meat and in the morning you'll be filled with bread. And you'll know that I am the Lord your God. So it came about in the evening that the quail came and covered the camp because they had no food. 
So the meat came in the evening, and in the morning there was a layer of dew on the campground. And when the layer of dew evaporated, behold, the surface of the wilderness was like a fine, flaky thing, like frost on the ground. The sons of Israel saw it, and they said, what is it? Which is the word manna. What is it? For they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, it's the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. It said that it tasted like wafers and honey. Woo, sounds like a breakfast food to me. This is what the Lord commanded. Gather it, every man, as much as he should eat. Take an omar, a piece, according to the number of persons of each in your household or in your tent. The sons of Israel did so. And some gathered lots and some gathered little. And when they measured it with an omar, he who gathered much had no access. No excess. And he who gathered little had no lack. That right there. That's amazing. Your morning devotion, it will only ever be just enough. It will never be more and it will never be less. All you need to do is hear from the Lord in the morning and he will set your day up for success. The evening meal is of meat. And this is the mystery I'll be quick about this, but I want to set this pattern. And I'm telling you that if you will live like this, the Lord will transform your life. The evening meal is the place where there is substance to it. You know, you, you have dinner with your family, and then you have the evening. Whatever you meditate on in the evening is what your dream life will be based on. Your subconscious will be working on it. There's mystery and there is formation. Whatever calories you burned off in the daytime and the workouts and all that, your sleep is where the Lord refreshes and rebuilds your, your bodies. He does that as well with your spiritual journey. If you unlock and you labor into, you eat the meat of the word in the evening, your subconscious will work on it. The Lord will reveal mysteries to you. Before you go to sleep at night, you should ask the Lord deep questions, expecting him to speak to you. You don't know what to do. God, I need wisdom. Lord, I'm needing you to speak. Lord, I'm lifting up to you this list of prayers. Whatever it is, your journey, your deep things, lay it before the Lord before you go to sleep. Unload your burdens. And in the night season, the Lord will give you dreams. He'll speak to you answers. He'll unlock mysteries. Job 33 says that the Lord hides instructions inside of men in their dreams. They're too busy during the daytime to hear. And so he locks away the instruction at night so that during your waking hours, you'll be going through your day and suddenly you'll be like, man, this is like deja vu. I was just thinking about this. Oh, I bet you were. Because the Holy Spirit is brilliant. In the night, the Lord unveils things that he could never reveal to you during the day. So if you'll take time, and here's the pattern. Study the word at night. Study the word at night. Have a devotional time before you go to bed. Put away social media. Read the Bible before you go to bed. Put away television shows. Have your quiet time before bed. And watch as the Lord unlocks revelation to you. Have a little bit of intimate connection with the Lord before you go to sleep. And watch as the Lord causes vibrancy to come from your, your, your marriage and your family life. You have children? After dinner, have a little devotional time with your family. Read the word together. Ask deep questions. Process a little bit. Don't just get lost in media. Don't just let them run off. Spend a little bit of time just connecting and digging into a mystery, ask them questions, invite them into the conversation, and watch as God breathes into your family a breath of life. But what about the morning? Pastor Jamie, I'm a morning person. I like morning devotions. Praise God. Can I tell you that you will never be able to eat enough on that morning devotion to sustain the mystery life? Nope. The bread in the morning is just for the day. You can do 10 minutes or you can do 10 hours of study in the morning and it will only ever just be enough for the day. In the morning time, that bread, it's for revealing the glory of the Lord. He will give you words of knowledge. He'll drop on you wisdom. And during that day, you watch 
I'm telling you, this, I, this is my practice. I read a proverb a day. I do it in the morning. It makes, takes me five minutes. When I, you want a little peek into my devotional life? Your pastor is not spending hours every morning. Nope, I got too much to do. I'm, I am waiting on the Holy Spirit to unlock things. So if you come and you have a meeting during the day and it's like I drop a bomb on you, like I had a word of knowledge, I had a word of wisdom for you, I gave you a prophetic word, I promise you it came in my five-minute devotion that morning. I crack the word, and I read the proverb of the day. I read until the Lord breathes on something, until something pops, until life springs up in my soul. And then I know I got what I needed for the day. And then I assume that whatever that was, that that is the answer to every question that the people I'm going to meet with today are asking. You walk away thinking I'm a genius. And it turns out that God gives you bread to demonstrate his goodness to the people around you. Nope. I feast in the evening on the word, and the Lord unlocks mysteries, and he unlocks my revelatory life, and he gives me dreams. In the morning, in the daytime, that's about labor. That's about you. It's about revealing God's goodness. It's about what I'm going to interact with this day. And the Lord always gives me my daily bread Pray then in this way, Lord, give me my daily bread. Because in that, the Lord will provide for you, yes, but for everyone that's going to have need today. It's a secret. Shh, don't tell anybody. My friend Caleb Byerly is a missionary, and Caleb's got incredible God stories. He has had dreams of Aboriginal people groups that according to uh, like Wycliffe and the uh, anthropologists that the, that people group doesn't exist. And yet the Lord in a dream had him see a people group, the Tinananun, had in that dream that people group show him this instrument. And this instrument was unique in something like Caleb had never seen before. And in the dream, he sees and meets the Tinnanun, and he sees the instrument. That's the dream. Because it's a God dream, he knows the dimensions and sees and understands the making of this instrument, and Caleb happens to be an instrument maker. Now, what do you do with dreams? How do you follow them? What, what is it? Is, it? is this just advice? What is God telling you in this dream? Do you, do you go to your dream journal and you try to interpret the dream? Oh, I wonder what the cat intestine string means, Lord. I wonder what the, the bowl-like instrument means, and so I'm trying to interpret it so that I can know what to do. Nope, that's not Caleb. Caleb just looks at it and goes, oh, God wants me to make an instrument and meet this people. Very simple. It's not profound. In fact, he's looking at it as instruction, and so he spends six months trying to make this instrument that's impossible because the dimensions of it and the way that it's engineered and all that stuff has never been done before. It's just an impossible instrument to make, and he should know he's an instrument maker. So he spends six months trying to make the instrument, and he fails. He fails miserably many times over. But then one day he's on a bus in Manila, Philippines, and across from him is sitting there this man, and this man is looking at him intently. And Caleb's still feeling a little bit like, eh, you know, he's a white, you know, uh, um, young man. You know, he's not a very big statured guy, and so he's thinking, oh, oh am I in trouble? Am I going to get beat up or whatever? And this guy is just staring him down. And Caleb keeps looking up, and the guy's still staring at him. And finally... The Lord's, the, he, Caleb's like, what should I do, Lord? And the, the Lord says to him, ask him about the Tinnananun. And Caleb, under his breath, is like, no. <laughs> because Caleb has sought every resource known to man about, is this a real people group? And has failed. No, this isn't a real people group. You're making this up. And Caleb's thinking, I don't want to look dumb. And besides, this guy looks like he wants to beat me up. And so finally, the Lord's like, no, ask him. And so Caleb eh, looks up, and he goes, hey, excuse me. And the guy perks up, looks at him intently. He says, do you know the Tinnananun? The eyes guy, this guy's eyes get huge. He says, how do you know my people? Because it turns out it's a hidden tribe, and they have been hidden because they are so remote 
and they are encircled with terrorist camps. And so they're cut off from modern civilization, and no one can get in and out of them. But this man snuck out and has been attending medical school so that he could take modern medicine back into his tribe. Not only that, but this guy, during his college time, got radically and gloriously saved by Jesus. And he's been asking the question of the Lord, how do I get the gospel to go back into my... Because this tribe, the Tinnananda, was a violent tribe. And so Caleb asked... You know the Tinanano, he says, how do you know my people group? And they begin to discuss and talk, and it turns out he's saved and blah, 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 and, and that this guy's been praying and asking. And Caleb says, hey, I noticed that you were looking at me really intent. He said, yes, because I had a dream last night, and you were in it. <laughs> See, Caleb's just walking the dream out. And if you know the story, the long and the short of it is that Caleb ends up one more time trying to build that instrument and succeeds ends up taking the multi, multi hour multi-day traveling trip back into the very dangerous part. Remote, remote island in the Philippines, surrounded by terrorist camps, very dangerous if he is caught. He brings the instrument that he has made and ends up before the high tribal chief. 50 chiefs in this tribe. It's a tribe of 100,000 people that's been hidden from modern day. Caleb brings the instrument in and presents it to this chief. And the chief says to him, how did you come by this? And Caleb says, well, I just sort of made it. And this man says, no, how did you come by this? And Caleb ends up saying, well, I had a dream. And in the dream, this instrument appeared. And so I made it to bring to you. And the man says, how did you come by this instrument? Caleb says, well, I believe that God told me about your tribe and I am here to share with you. That chief calls a meeting of all the high chiefs, 50 of them. They all gathered in their, this chief's house. They all are there. And they walk in one by one and they see this instrument and they all go in salimba, salimba. And they all know exactly what it is. Because 150 years earlier, a tribal war took place where the other tribe took and destroyed this instrument from their culture. And the only person alive at the time to be able to make it, because it was a sacred instrument, so the knowledge only ever existed with one person. And that person died without ever repeating or making the instrument. So it was just lost. And so the tribe had a prophecy, had a word, that when the Salimba returns that the uncreated God would be riding inside of it and would present his way of salvation to them. Because that instrument was the instrument that they worshiped the God of all gods with. Church, I know, Caleb, this is just... A, a, a country kid from the mountains of North Carolina. If you met him, the outside, nothing. It doesn't stand out. The world isn't going to go, wow, that's someone to know. But the Lord saw something in Caleb, first of all, that he would be obedient just to simply obey and to do what God was telling him to do. The Lord tested him with his word. And I want to read one last passage of scripture so that you understand what I'm saying. This is Exodus Chapter 16, verse 4. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread down from heaven for you, and the people will go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instructions. Every day, God wants to take you on an adventure. Every day, the Lord wants to walk with you. He'll reveal step by step who you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do with your life. And your life's calling will emerge, but it is as you take the journey with him. You want to go deep with God? You want to have some serious oil in your life, intimacy with God? The uncreated God giving you mysteries and revealing things to you? Awesome. You should eat that evening meal with him. You should go to sleep every night expecting God of the universe to speak to you. He's going to unlock things to you. You, but oh my, you need to know that when he talks to you, he's expecting fruit. 
He's expecting outcome. He's looking to you to perform his word. You can't just have itching ears running from one conference to the next. Let me hear another good word. Let me hear another good word. No, no, no. No, because we are a people who are emerging and becoming. Are you alive today? Friends, who you are before the Lord, you're accountable to him alone. No one can tell you. How do you get there? Well, it's not by predicting the future. It's by taking each day and walking with him. Each day, wake up. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Each day, read his word. Take that bread. Put it into practice. Understand he's going to demonstrate his goodness during the day. You're going to have answers for other people. Each night, eat a good, solid meal of meat. Receive. Let the Lord unlock mysteries to you. Expect your dream life to go off, off the hook. Watch as God invades your life and brings transformation through it. Would you stand to your feet today? Three people clapping. Yeah. That's all right. No, 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 no. That's all right. Just put a hand on your own heart. Lord, get them. Get them good. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you'll open that door, we'll have fellowship. He said, we'll, we'll have supper together. We'll have an evening meal. If you'll open the door of your heart, he'll begin to fellowship with you. But you got to unlock that. You, got, you can't be afraid. You can't pretend. Listen, you don't need another religious duty thing. And let me tell you, this church is not about just, like, this isn't about attendance. And it's certainly not about pretending. You can't fake it before God. You got to be honest with your journey. And when the Holy Spirit brings conviction about things, the expectation is that you're going to make changes in your life. Why? Because you're called to greatness, really and truly. And your Father in heaven loves you. And it does not matter where you've been. It matters where you're going. It doesn't matter where you've been, what poor decisions you've made in your history. The Lord is here and his mercy is present. And he is inviting you to step into the light and to take this journey with you. He says, son, daughter, I love you. Let's go on an adventure together. Embrace the path of life that's set before you. Don't be afraid. But you do have to let go. All false identities need to fall away. They cannot stay if you're going to embrace who God says you are. Every lower identity, every lower identity, you have to let those things go. Who you are has not yet been revealed. You are emerging. You're a child of God, and there's so much more in your future than what others have said you are, what culture says you are, people groups have said you are, the labels that society has put on you. you that's not who you are. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. And the king is beckoning you to go on an adventure with him. Father in heaven, I'm asking this morning by your Holy Spirit that you would surround each one and that the weightiness of your presence would come crashing in. If you've been clinging to lesser identities, if, if you got labeled by society, if you have been painted in a certain light, in a way, if you've embraced some kind of lower identity, if that stuff, you need to let that stuff go this morning because the Lord is calling to you. If you've been far away from Jesus and you have not been journeying with him, but you want to go on the adventure, if you want to embrace the call that's on your life, then my friends, all you got to do right now is open the door of your heart. He's standing right here and he's speaking to you. His mercy is new every day. He'll forgive you, he'll wash you, but you got to get real with him. Holy Spirit, would you come right now? Would you just invite him? Lord, would you come and speak to me right now? Father, I pray that you would unlock the night season for people. Lord, that every time they open your word, Lord, that you'd speak to them and you'd unlock mysteries to them and you would give instruction and help them, Lord, to leave behind the life of, of the slave and embrace, Lord, the life of the king. Holy Spirit, you would disciple them day by day, word by word. 
Father, I pray for the evening meal, Lord, that it would become glorious in families and weighty in discussion. And Lord, that hearts would be awakened to purpose. So much would take place. And then, Lord, I pray also for the mornings. God, that every day that people get up, that they would hear and gather the bread for the day. Lord, I, I pray that you would unlock your word. It'd be light and easy. And for the business person who says, I don't have time for morning devotions. Oh, you do. Come on. Just turn your heart towards him. Unlock your heart towards him and receive from him. He'll speak right into your circumstance and it'll be the exact key for the day. Lord, unlock your word to your people. Holy Spirit, breathe on. Every time they, they turn their hearts towards you, God, would you breathe on them. Let the oil of intimacy be poured out in them. Encounter after encounter after encounter. Father, I speak to the prophets in the room and the prophetic giftings, God, that it would be stirred up to a whole other level, Lord, of encouragement and impartation, God, that mysteries would be unlocked, O oh Lord, and maturity would come. Thank you, Father, for that. Thank you for that. Now, church, I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm asking that every person pray with me. Okay, it's a prayer of invitation. Because every one of us wants what I'm saying this morning, and each person's got to take their own journey. And so I'm asking every person out loud, would you please pray with me? Just repeat after me. Okay, the God haters in here to the God lovers. Doesn't matter where you're at. Every person. Would you pray with me this morning? Father in heaven. Thank you for sending Jesus that he died in my place and that his blood sacrifice is enough. And this covenant makes me a child of God. And so I receive it today. His death for my sin. His blood so I could become a child of God. I receive his sacrifice in my place. Jesus, be my Lord. I open my life to you. I want to fellowship with you. I want to journey with you. Be my Lord and Savior, my King. And Holy Spirit, empower me, fill me, seal me for this work that I might become who you created me to be. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we give a good clap to the Lord today? May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's countenance and favor be upon you and grant you grace and peace. And everybody who agreed with that said, amen. God bless you guys. Have an amazing, amazing week.